what if people's response to change was much more complex than that? Um, then you start to ask some really useful questions about how you implement change in a way that people are not going to resist and or are less likely to resist. So mm -hmm. that's why I think it's important. That's why I really like to challenge these thought stopping cliches. Hi, my name's Stephen. Welcome to the podcast, Challenging Leadership. And as normal, we like to challenge what we think we know about leadership and management. And as always, I'm happy to say hello to my friend across the pond, Jared Scott. Hi, Jared. Hey, Stephen. How are you doing today? Yeah, I'm very well. I'm very well. Looking forward to talking about our topic for today, which is... Oh, goodness. It's about what if people <laughs> like change? <laughs> yeah. So I, I, I really, as what if people didn't hate change? That is my, that's, right. um, yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's my actual type. So yeah. Um, so I was really trying to your, be controversial already. I'm, 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 I'm changing I'm, the topic up already. I'm in that mood today. Yeah. So I need a um, second cup of coffee. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. So one of the things that, um, I, I like, I suppose that part of the reason why we call this podcast challenging leadership is that I like to, I don't know, be a bit of a contrarian from time to time and just ask questions about things that we think we know about leadership and management and so on. And there's also these things that um, you're familiar with, I know, called thought stopping cliches. And a thought stopping cliche is that that phrase or statement that we just make or that people make, and it's just expected that, oh yeah, that's kind of the last word on that. You know, that, mm -hmm. okay, that's a fact. That's a truism. Um, there's no arguing with it. Let's move on to the next thing, you know. And often that's mm -hmm. used as a way to kind of, I don't know, just sort of beat somebody's idea down or just, it's just um, accepted as being true. And the one that I'm going to talk about today is, it actually appears in your book, which is a fantastic book, by the way. Everybody should read it. But there is a phrase in that that um, that stood out to me, which is people don't like change. And so for me, this is a thought stopping cliche. And I want to yeah. have an attempt as a provocation, I suppose, to burst that particular thought stopping cliche um, because I don't really agree with it as a statement of fact. Well, I'm I'm ready to get into this. I'm okay. I'm I'm uh, I'm I'm very I'm very curious. Right. <laughs> People don't like change, Stephen. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> so okay, so my argument yeah. is it goes something like this. You know, um, I think people change things all the time. Um, so people they move house. Um, by people I mean we. We move house. Mm -hmm. We change jobs. We start relationships, we end relationships, we uh, change jobs, we change, um, we increase our education. These are all forms of change. We change our car, we, we, we change our computers and our um, domestic appliances and so on and so on. So we, we actually, uh, we even go on a holiday or vacation, you know, so we'll, we'll say, right, this month i'm going to spend in a completely different house and in a different country maybe um sleeping in a different bed and i'm going to say that um at the end of that i'm going to be refreshed i'm going to have enjoyed that so actually people will seek out change now that's not to say that there's no uh, a little bit of fear perhaps or apprehension sometimes you know if you're changing your job you might still mm -hmm. feel a bit apprehensive but it's not as simple as saying people don't like change because people move towards it. They, they, they actually want to change things. Um, yeah. And so it's a bit too simplistic to just make that, that statement. So for me, and I think one of the dangers of, of making this statement that people don't like change is that it's, it's almost like, well, that's the way it is. Therefore we're just going to have to kind of cope with people's unhappiness and find a way of, of sort of smoothing that off a bit. But it, it sort of, if you say actually, well, what if people didn't hate change? What if people, what if people's response to change was much more complex than that? Um, then you start to ask some really useful questions about how you implement change in a way that people are not going to resist and, or are less likely to resist. 
So mm-hmm. that's why I think it's important. That's why I really like to challenge these thought stopping cliches. Um, yeah. So I, I've, obviously, I've got a bit more to say, but I, otherwise, it's yeah. just going to be. Can a I monologue. stop your thoughts? I got, I got, I got go a it. counterpoint here. No, yeah, <laughs> no, no. I, um, I, I can't disagree with what you're, what you're saying there. But I think what's interesting is a lot of the things that you cited were actually not all the time, but most of the time, those are things that we get, we, we decide the change, we choose the change. Um, and, uh, so, so yeah, it's a blanket statement to say that people hate change. And I think, um, you know, something that, that I would be more referring that to is, Hey, you're, you're going to do this. Or, you know, I think there's, there's a difference between, between going to the, um, the store front and you got the ice cream stand there and you're a kid and you say, I love the chocolate ice cream. And, um, your father says, well, I don't care if you like chocolate, you're, you're getting vanilla this time. <laughs> and, and that's where, that's where it's not really, you're, you you're not getting a choice in the matter. So, yeah. so unfortunately, yeah. I mean, sometimes in great companies, I know you talked about toxic companies, but in, in great uh, companies where they're, they're led in a fine manner, they do, they do get buy-in from employees, but that doesn't happen much. So I think that there's that stereotype that does fit a lot of times that, change usually comes with doom and gloom and it's never negative. They never say, Hey, guess what, everybody, we're reducing the cost of your insurance or guess what, <laughs> you know, it's usually the change is, well, we're going to have to cut back on things. And, um, so, so there's that there, you know, and, and, and that's not always the case, but yeah. there's this, um, there's a generalization out there. I think that, that when you're thinking about a corporate world, change is usually never good. And that's in a way that is my absolute point is that it's it's wrong to say that people don't like change in a way that puts the blame on yeah. the poor sods who are the the people who have to put up with it. You know, it's not, actually not they don't yeah. like change. It's not that they have any rational fear of change. It's that they don't yeah. want their um, their their conditions reducing or whatever it is. And and I think you've actually hit the nail on the head um, when you talk about. Um, that that change it's when it's uh, there's no choice to it so i don't know whether i was thinking about this word i i use this word foisted it's foisted upon you i don't know if this is a word that um has made it across the ponds but um, not much but i mean i know what you're talking about (laughs) change change when it's foisted upon us um Mm -hmm. is is much is much more relevant so that's actually what we're talking about and and this relates to um, I'm going to get a bit of psychological theory in here at this point. I've tried sure. to reduce the amount that I bang on about um, psychological theories, but this one is a this one is a real good one, and it's it's called self determination theory, and it it basically says that that we have human beings have three um, basic psychological needs, and the first mm-hmm. one is autonomy, a sense of autonomy. The second one is a sense of relatedness. And the third one is a sense of competence. So we actually have these three needs. And so we need to feel that we have some autonomy over what we do, that we belong to something bigger than ourselves, and that we are able to do stuff. So that's basically what we're talking Mm -hmm. about. And so I think actually, when we think about changing the workplace, often we we are unfortunately undermining all three of those at least two of those but often all three of those you know so first of all we don't have any say in the matter we've got to now move from this team to that team they're forming a new team you're no longer going to be a part of the service team you're going to be a part of this team over here so first of all you've had no say in it so autonomy is um is gone and then your relatedness well you you belonged to this team that you you knew everybody you, you sat next to Gemma and uh, Bob and um, you know you got used to his clearing his throat every five minutes and, uh, and that was kind of <laughs> that you, you got to know them and you you know you yeah, sort yeah, of part sure, of little, comfort in that yeah. yeah exactly and yeah. Uh, now that's gone so you're no longer part of that little community so the relatedness bit has been undermined and and then also, because you're having to do a new thing, there might be stuff about the new job that you don't really know how to do it. And you think, well, I know how to do that old job, but now I don't know how to do this new one. I'm going to feel less competent. So it's actually suppressing three really important mm-hmm. basic psychological needs. So that's the problem. It's not that people don't yeah. like change. It's that people don't like losing their autonomy losing their connections with who they know and what they know and feeling 
um, they don't like feeling incompetent. So that's yeah. why I, that's why I think you know, and I think most of us know this at some level, but it's just that that cliche, that self, or that thought stopping cliche, sort of. It's almost like, oh well, that's just the way it is, and people are just going to naturally not like it. Let's just think how yeah. how we can push these people around a bit more so that they yeah. won't make such a fuss. Yeah. And it, so, so while you were speaking and I'm, I'm thinking everything you said there really resounded to me very strongly. Like I'm, I know we're trying to disagree, but I'm like, I, I agree with that, but here's something interesting about what you said about all those things. I've seen change happen where it was an awesome, positive change and people didn't like it. <laughs> and they're like, why? And it's like, because they sprung it on everybody and everybody's like, Oh, why are they doing this? Yeah. What's going on? Yeah. Why are they trying to butter us up? <laughs> you know? Yeah. And, and so, um, and autonomy is so important in being part of a community and everything, but you know, regardless of whether you have change or you don't have change, how important is it that we as leaders communicate the why? Like, Hey, this is why we're doing that. Like I know um, a friend of mine works for a company where, um, they had some issues and they had a week of production shut down. And so at the end of the year, everybody thought because they were doing so well, they were going to get this, this gigantic bonus and the bonus wasn't as big. Um, it, <clears throat> what people didn't realize is that they had been paid for that week when there really was no business going on during the year. People, not everybody put two and two together. Some people did, but I'm just saying that looking back on it in hindsight, the the uh, the the owners of the company were like, you know, we probably should have just said, hey, just so you know, this is why. And it, just those those few sentences would have alleviated all that discord and resentment and like, what the heck's going on? Yeah. And um, so, you know, change is inevitable. Um, but I think you can get people to like change or at least accept change more readily if there's clear communication. Um, when, when change happens, you know, like the dad, you were doing this because I said, so we can't treat adults like children. We have yeah. to, we have to give them the information. Yeah, I, to I totally agree. And there's, um, I mean, for me, there's like, there's two different sorts of change that we're probably talking about in different ways, but there's, there's the change that has to come from an enterprise level, let's call it. So something mm -hmm. like, um, decision about the bonus, for instance, is a mm -hmm. good example of, I, I can't see in most practical senses how that's ever going to be taken by anyone other than the senior team, because clearly they have the responsibility to know how much they're able to pay the bonus. And so in that case, the only thing that's open to you is to communicate clearly like you've, like you've explained. And I, I totally agree with that. But then there's other change that by the time we're thinking about how can we make this um, more palatable, in a way it's too late. Mm -hmm. So it's like I, I have this other phrase that I use, which I hope isn't a, a thought-stopping cliche, but is um, <laughs> something better than buy-in. So in, in mm. our um industries we often talk about getting buy-in and, and i totally get sure. what that means um you know we want people to buy into the change but in a way what that sets up is a dynamic that is a salesperson and the person that's being sold something because that's what the word means buy-in means i want you to buy into this in other words i'm going to sell it to you so then what happens is you've actually set up a situation where the manager is a salesperson. Now, no, you know, no shade on salespeople because it is the most important job for many industries. Um, we don't get anywhere unless we can sell it. Mm -hmm. But a lot of people don't want to be sold to and they know they can spot it a mile off when they're being sold to. So if we start from the premise that, right, we've got this great idea as a senior management team, all right, how do we sell it to the team? How do we get buy-in? I think that's the wrong way around. Actually, what's a better way of doing it? Again, remembering that we're not talking about here about change that has to come from the enterprise level, but other change that 
often does come from the highest levels, but doesn't necessarily need to. So what mm-hmm. actually should be happening is as a business, we are educating, training, helping the the teams, the middle managers, the first line managers to really understand what matters within our business and how to do things better. Um, And those first line managers also create that within their own teams. We also empower people to be able to spot opportunities for change and make change. We have a situation here now where this is what we would normally call continuous improvement. So actually, mm-hmm. we our teams are spotting improvement opportunities. They're educated and trained in how to design change, to make sure that it works effectively, to measure the effects. Um, and so actually, most of the change then comes from the teams themselves. Mm-hmm. So you no longer have to sell them on mm-hmm. the change because they own it already. Yeah. And that's that's my philosophy that I try to to train. In fact, it's uh, I've, I've developed a new course that I might as well get a plug-in for myself, which is... Um, Let's do it. I'm yeah, excited called, about this. Leading people and change in an era of disruption. And it's, it's a 40-hour contact time program that really deals with how to create the culture where change becomes the norm. And yeah, of mm. course, there are times when we have to do top-down change, but it's it's much more effective when we can um, when we can create conditions where actually change happens all the time as a result of the teams identifying the need for it and making it happen. So that's, you know, for me, that's, that's the answer, at least partially. You're still going to have those mm-hmm. moments where you've got some bad news, you've got to tell the team, and it's about giving them the reason why and all of that. But that should be reserved for a very small slither of that, uh, that pie um, of change, if you like, <laughs> a pie of change. So, sure. um, you know, that's, that's my thoughts on it. Yeah, no. Um, so, so here, here's a question. Um, yeah. I was trying to think about how to say this, say this in a, in the right way, but, um, you know, people are given the power to make little changes, you know, like you empower your team. And I think, um, I've seen sometimes people are reluctant to even do that because they're like, well, our company's slow to not change if we make a change. <laughs> like, in other words, what if the change is terrible? We realize we made a change, but we're just going to keep doing it. You know, it's like uh, not not to uh, not to talk about like Manchester United, but you know, like they, they're they're running a certain play and it isn't working, and the coach is like, we're just going to keep doing it, and the manager just it, and it still isn't working, and that's very frustrating for the fans, especially probably even for the players. But that can happen in the uh, business world where, yeah, we love this. That, uh, okay, some people like change. I'll, I'll agree with you. <laughs> but then it, it ends up being, this was a terrible idea. And because, because there's, no, um, there's no going forward, sorry for my rambling, but I'm just trying to make sure I get the point that yep. they, 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 they're like, well, I don't want change now because every time we do make a change, there's times where it's terrible, but we're not going to move because we, you guys pick this. So, so how, do you, how do you combat that? What are some things that you can do? Yeah, I mean, it's a great question, Jared, but I think, you know, the answer is, um, again, we, we treat our teams like adults and we train them in the really important thing which relates to change, which is measuring the current state, um, mm-hmm. finding a good way of understanding what where you currently are, then making your change and measuring the results of the change. And if you see that the change hasn't made the desired result, um, or has made things worse, then again, it's your responsibility to look at that and say, okay, that hasn't worked or it hasn't worked like we wanted to. You know, the obvious Deming cycle, plan, do, check, act is something that pretty much every manager comes across at some point. Um, it's, a, it's a very simple way of doing continuous improvement. So the, the idea of that is, you know, plan mm-hmm. what we're going to do. We mm-hmm. do it we analyze the effect and then we act upon that basis. And that is the very definition of, of continuous improvement. So mm-hmm. why are our team not able to do that for themselves and say, yep, yeah, that was a good idea. Actually, it hasn't delivered what we want. 
we'll either go back to what we did before or we'll find a, a better way of doing it. So that's part of the, mm-hmm. the Deming cycle that we've just described. Um, that's then again, it's, it's actually the team that are empowered with that knowledge and um, authority to be able to make those changes. Now, clearly there has to be some uh, controls around that. You know, we can't, Mm. just constantly be changing everything without any process yeah, but that's why absolutely. they need to have training and continuous improvement processes and part of that is communicating the change thinking about risks associated with the change that might happen downstream of your change you know and, and those are the things that we do we train people in when we're doing continuous improvement training so there's no reason why mm-hmm. they can't have that sort of knowledge of course, you need control, but I still think um, we we could we could do that, and we can do that. You know, that is what the best yeah, businesses actually do. That mm-hmm. absolutely, it's just it takes a fine balance, doesn't it? It's it's it uh, it's it's so easy to get totally the pendulum swings one way. You 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 let the uh, you let the workers have too much, and then it becomes a mess. And you let you let the uh, managers or leaders have too much, and then it still becomes a mess. <laughs> it's I think it's about. Uh, and this is where I, you know, I'm all about it being people led because, you know, that mm-hmm. is, I suppose, my general bent in terms of, of my own profession, you know, organizational psychology and so on. So I'm mm-hmm. going to think about the people element of it. But I think it is that's where the the control element comes in. And that's those, those are processes. So, yeah, mm-hmm. you empower people to make a change, but you you, you say you make it clear that if you are going to make a change to the process, then that itself needs to go through a process, a change process. Um, mm-hmm. You don't want to make it too bureaucratic. You don't want to make it um, too difficult. But yes, you can't have people just on a whim saying, oh, you know, I think I'm going to move that from there to there. Let's do that now. You know, there has yeah. to be a process. And, and therefore, that's what management is for. It's to just make sure that, okay, yep, yeah, that's fine. I'm happy with that change being made. Have you done the required work up front? Like, have you done a, a map of the current value stream or have you done a, mm-hmm. a brown paper exercise to see where the, um, the issues are? Let's just see you working out for that. Um, mm-hmm. Have you thought about the potential issues downstream that might be, because you've moved that table from there to there. Now the other team can't do their job. You know, have you thought about some of that stuff? Okay. You're satisfied that those things have been done. They've gone through that improvement process, but they're driving it. And yeah. Okay. Manager has their foot on the brake, but um, that's, it's still up to them to, to do those necessary things. So yeah, it's not, of course you're right. Balance is, is never easy. And, you know, um, I would say that I've not always got it right in every situation, but um, none of us do. <laughs> exactly, you know. But I still think yeah. that's the that's the way to to do it. Well, listen, when I um, I've got I've got my book here, so cool. I'm gonna. I'm going to do a second version of this eventually because I've got more things I want to add and I'm going to have an asterisk next to uh, the phrase, people don't like change. So, so Stephen, what would that asterisk say to you so that we can, we, we, we've challenged each other, but what would you yeah. say, what's the asterisk for that statement? Yeah, I mean, I think we would qualify that with um, something like, you know, people are uncomfortable when change is imposed upon them. Generally, mm. um, that's, that's something like that. I would I would say is a, probably a better way of describing it than people don't like change. I mean, the yeah. the illustration I would give. I was thinking about it before we started chatting. So in the UK, I think it's the same in the US. I, I listen to a lot of US podcasts, by the way, um, and you mm-hmm. seem to have so many of the same problems that we have, like house building for one. So young people struggle yeah. to get out of the housing market because there just simply isn't enough houses. And obviously, one of the problems you could identify is that um, you have some old people, um, sometimes a single occupant of a big house, you know, a five bedroom house, an older person whose family's grown up and left home, maybe their partner's died. So they're now rattling around in this huge house that they don't need all that space. And there's other young couples with two kids who can't even 
afford to buy a house or can't get on the housing ladder. So one yeah. of the things that could happen would be the government to impose a rule that said, um, you know, if you are past 70 and you live in a house um, that's five occupants and there's a single person, you've got to move. Now imagine mm. the political fallout that would come now, that Oof. would be the end of the government wouldn't it you know you couldn't yeah you couldn't impose that so that's right but what often will happen is that an older person will look around and say you know this house is too big for me you know i can't keep the the cleaning and the upkeep of it and it's hard to heat and you know and they might even say you know it's somebody somebody with more kids or bigger family needs to live in this place and they'll decide mm-hmm. to go and move in a small place or a, um, as we call them bungalows um, and it suits their needs better. So when that happens, of course, everything, everything works. Um, so that's the secret, I suppose, is it's to create a situation where that older person for themselves says, that's what I want to do because of my yeah. civic duty if you like but also because of my own practicalities um and so i think that's kind of the key for what we're trying to do um within within management we 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 Mm -hmm. want people to make those choices as much as possible understanding with the caveat that not all of them uh those choices are possible no i like that illustration that's that's very well put Cool. Are we are we there then? Do you reckon that's the end of another episode? I, I think it's the it's it's we've reached the end. I'd I'd love to keep chatting, but then we won't have anything to talk about with our next episode. <laughs> that's right. Okay. Well, that's good. I, I really enjoyed that chat. I've got that off my chest, um, and um, we've had a good chat about that. Thank you very much, Jared, and uh, thank you very much for listening, my everybody. Pleasure. Don't forget to tune in next time to Challenging Leadership. Bye for now. See you.